You know, we're, today we start a new series, as Victor said, called The Sayings of Jesus, The Last Sayings of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, the gospel writers record uh, seven final words or phrases that Jesus said as he was hanging on the cross that first Good Friday. And we call them the seven, uh, seven sayings of, of Jesus on the cross. And uh, with these words, Jesus did a couple of things. First of all, he forgave his enemies. He, he forgives the repentant thief that is hanging right next to him. He makes sure his mother is taken care of. He cries out to God. He declares the end of his earthly ministry and he commits his life to the Father. And uh, we're going to be looking at that for the next, uh, during our se Easter season. But you know, one of the questions that is always asked to me is if you've ever watched a movie or if you read your Bible, when Jesus was crucified on the cross on top of his head, there was a sign that had, and you usually see these letters. The letters are I-N-R-I. -I. And a lot of people have asked, what is that? What does that mean? I thought it would be a good time for me to explain that to you. By the way, those initials are, are Roman, uh, are Latin initials. And uh, the paraphrase uh, in the English is Jesus the Nazarene, King of the Jews. And, and John, in his gospel, John chapter 19, verse 19 and 20, he tells us that those words were written not only in Latin, but also in Hebrew and also in Greek during the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. By the way, Latin was the official Roman language. Greek was the official uh, uh, language of the commerce of the whole region. And then, of course, Hebrew was the language of the Jewish people that lived in Israel and around the world. But here they are in order. If you're wondering what were those uh, seven sayings, here they are. Statement number one, Luke tells us, is the, and we believe they're in this order. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Uh, statement number two was, today you will be with me in paradise. A statement number three is, woman, behold your son. And statement number four is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? A statement number five is, I thirst. Number six is, it is finished. And statement number seven is, Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit. During this series, you're going to be hearing sermons on each one of them. We're not going to follow that order. We're going to take them out of order. But you're going to hear the seven, uh, the seven words of Jesus from the cross. What I want to do today is I want to start off by speaking to you on the subject of it is finished, uh, which is the, the statement number five. Notice it doesn't say you're finished. It says it is finished. You know, some people think uh, when it comes to God and their relationship with God, they're finished. God wants nothing to do with you. A lot of people think that God is done with you. God is mad at you. But that is not the case. Listen, God is not mad at you. God is madly in love with you. God is not finished with you. It doesn't mean when it says it's finished. It does not mean he's done with you. It means something else. Now, before I get to that, I, I was reading a story that, uh, that sort of parallels this. It's a story that's found in the Gospel of John in chapter 8. It's a story about a woman caught in the act of adultery. You know, often uh, we hear a lot about presidential pardons or, or gubernatorial pardons. Uh, and I, was, I did a little research, and since coming into office, Governor Newsom has granted a total of 140 pardons. And pardons come in two forms. They come in commutations or they come in reprieves. You know, a pardon, if you don't know what a pardon is, a pardon is an expression of forgiveness granted to a person in recognition of taking responsibility for the crime and having good conduct for a significant period after conviction. In other words, a, a pardon is uh, not that you were found innocent, not that, you know, well, oops, we made a mistake, which we're finding out they're making a lot of mistakes. But this is, look, at you've been in prison 15, 20 years for a crime. You've been good. Uh, we're going to let you out early. We're going to pardon you. That's what a pardon is. A reprieve usually is an act of clemency that's extended to a prisoner to give him opportunity to, to, to build up a defense. It's usually, reprieves are usually given to people that have been given the death penalty. And, uh, you know, their, their, their date of execution is coming up, and the reprieve is, we're going to halt that, we're going to stop it, we're going to give you a chance to have your lawyers or whoever's working on your case, you know what, to try to put together, a, a, you know, a, a, a good trial or a, a good presentation. But in the Gospel of John, in chapter 18, the religious leaders bring to Jesus a woman that is caught in the act of adultery. And I want you to catch that. She was caught in the act of adultery. And by the way, in Jewish law, that was punishable by death. In other words, they bring her to Jesus and they say, Lord, she's finished. She's done. You know what? We've caught her red-handed. Not secondhand, not rumors, not innuendo. We caught her in the act of committing adultery. But when she thought her life was over and finished or done, Jesus says some amazing words to her. Jesus invites her 
to a new start, a new beginning, a, a, a new life. And that's an amazing story. But let me, let me go over the story and let me tell you what happened. First of all, I want you to notice that in that story of the adulterous woman, the religious leaders, they bring her to Jesus and they demand punishment. They want her to be put to death. Look at what it says in, in John chapter 8, verse 2. It says, but early the next morning, he, speaking of Jesus, he was back at the temple. And a crowd soon gathered and he sat down and he taught them. Let me stop there. Notice he sat down. You know, rabbis did most of their teaching sitting down. Not all the time, but most of the time they sat. You know, today we're a little blown away when we see a pastor sit down when he preaches. Listen, Jesus did it. There's nothing wrong with it. It's just that we're not used to seeing it. But in Jesus' days, that's what they did. Look at verse 3. And as he, speaking of Jesus, was speaking, the teachers of the religious law and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in the act of adultery. And they put her in front of the crowd. Teacher, they said to Jesus, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. The law of Moses says to stone her, what do you say? Now I find it interesting that they're trying to teach Jesus about what the law says. You know what, Jesus knows more about the law than they would ever know. And they're trying to school Jesus. And I love Jesus because Jesus would have said, don't try to school me. I know more about the law than you. But he doesn't say that because he's a humble man. But but I, I want you to notice that these religious leaders... You know, in in the days of Jesus, religious leaders saw everything as black and white. They bring her to Jesus and they say, she's guilty, she deserves death. I want you to know there's there's no compassion. There's no concern for the woman at all whatsoever. She's guilty and very simply she should die. There was no love from the Pharisees toward the people. It was very, as a matter of fact. You know what? That's why the Bible says that we are to speak the truth, but we're to do it with love. You know, whenever we have something harsh to say or something that people might take in a wrong way, do it with love and do it with compassion. Don't be harsh. Don't be rude like these guys are. No, they, they bring this woman caught in the act. They throw her before Jesus in front of the crowd. Now, I don't know how many people were there, but Jesus wasn't by himself. You know, they had no compassion. They could care less about the woman. All they could care about is, you know what, they wanted to hear what Jesus would say. And, of course, Jesus very wisely is going to answer them. I was, as I was reading this, I, I was reminded of a story of a, of a pastor. A pastor got fired. Uh, his congregation said, Pastor, we don't want you being our pastor anymore. And he asked why, and they said, because you, you preach about hell a lot. And we don't like the fact that you preach about hell. So the congregation fires him. They hire a new pastor. And he also preached a lot about hell, but the people loved him. Someone, was, someone asked him, well, what's the difference? You fired the other guy. You loved this guy. And they both did the same thing. And the members of the congregation says, yeah, this new guy, you know what? He preaches a lot about hell, but you know, he preaches with such compassion. You know, it's like he, he, it hurts him that, you know what? Because of our disobedience or because of our rejection, we're going to go to hell. The other guy, when he would preach about hell, it's like he was happy. There was a smirk in his face. He was happy we were all going to go to hell. He was excited that we were going to go to hell. And that's the difference. What's the moral of that story? Be careful how you talk to people. Be careful what you have to say. You know, in fact, you know, the text tells us that the whole reason for them bringing Jesus to her was to trap, entrap Jesus. She was just the pawn. So they parade the woman out and they make her stand humiliated, terrified before the crowd, probably half naked. I don't think they covered her up. And, and we must ask, you know, I don't know if you're thinking, where's the guy? If you caught her in the act of adultery, there was someone with her. Why do you just bring her and don't bring the guy? You know, and I'll tell you why. Because their motives were not pure. They just wanted to entrap Jesus. That's what verse 6 tells us. Notice what it says. They were trying to trap him, who Jesus, into saying something they could use against him. But Jesus stooped down and he wrote in the dust with his finger. And they kept demanding an answer. Notice he ignores them. They're talking, blah, 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 Jesus, come on, what do you say, blah, blah, blah. He, sto- he's, he stoops down, starts writing, but then it says he stood up again, and he said, all right, but let the one who has never sinned throw the first stone, and then he stooped down again, and he wrote in the dust. Notice, he's not done, gets up, says, all right, go ahead, do what you want, but those of you that are not guilty, throw the first stone, and then he writes again. Now, some of you are asking, what did he write? We don't know. It doesn't tell us. But the Bible tells us that as he began to write, all these uh, Pharisees, they begin to leave one by one. Now, there's a lot of speculation about what Jesus wrote. Some have suggested, well, he wrote down their sin. He said, hey, you big guy, here's what you do. You shouldn't be throwing rocks. Hey, you little guy, this is what you do. You're, you know, you got, you got skeletons in your closet too. In other words, 
it is believed that Jesus probably wrote some stuff about them that they, they, ought, you know, that they thought nobody knew. Or maybe he wrote, you know what, judge, at least you be judged. But whatever it was, the Bible says, look at what verse 9 says. When the accusers heard this, or they saw this, they slipped away one by one, beginning with the oldest, until only Jesus was left in the middle of the crowd with the woman. Notice, oldest one left first. And you think, well, how come the oldest? They probably had a lot more skeletons in their closet than the young ones, right? So they're probably saying, man, I better get out of here before he starts pointing out all the stuff that, that I thought nobody knew. All right? Because it's, you know, it's, inter- it's always interesting how we point out what people do wrong, but we forget we have a lot of stuff that we've done wrong, and we don't like anybody to point it out, so they leave, right? Now, one of the questions that I ask myself is, what is this telling us? What, what does this exchange say to us? Well, let me give you a couple ideas about what's happening and why this is important. Number one, it shows that the religious leaders were more concerned about the sin. Uh, Jesus was more concerned about the sinner. You know, the Pharisees were the religious leaders, and they looked down their noses at people. You know, the religious leaders thought they were better than everybody else. You know, I I think sometimes Christians, we do that. I think sometimes Christians, we can be that way. And I want to say to you, please don't look down your nose at people. Please don't do that. Don't be that way here at Living Word. Would you commit to say to me, Pastor Vic, no worries, not here at Living Word. We don't look down at people. You know what? We don't point out everything that's wrong in the lives of people. Because you know, there is a lot wrong. You know what? When we come to the Lord, some of us come and we're pretty messy. Amen. None of us come with perfect lives. I, when I came to the Lord 50 years ago, I didn't come with a perfect life. And I was only 16 years old. You know, and, and, but there's people, you know, that, that are very, they're, they're, they like to point fingers. And, and be careful with that because it's by the grace of God that you are saved and that same grace that saved you will save them. It's extended to people regardless of where they come from. You know what I have noticed about finger pointers? I've noticed that they like to draw attention to themselves. In other words, they want to make sure you know how religious they are, how spiritual they are, and they want you to know how rotten you are compared to them. What I have noticed about pin, uh, finger pointing people is that they want attention. They want you to put them on a pedestal because they're so good, they're so wonderful. But you know what they really are? They're Pharisees. They are like the religious leaders in the day of Jesus. You know, these finger-pointing, critical, judgmental people point out every time you mess up, every time you make a mistake, every time you sin, and and they're going to make sure you know, and they're going to make sure other people know about your mistake, your your bad choices, your sins. And that's what these religious leaders are. But Jesus, you know what? He's not concerned about her sin. He's concerned about her. You know, God loves people. And God knows that people come with messy lives, and he still loves us. Sometimes we, we don't love them. But one of the things that I want you to get from this story is that some people focus on sin, other people focus on the sinners, and Jesus focused on the sinners, and he loved her the way he loves you. Listen, there's nothing that you do in life that eliminates you or disqualifies you from God's love. There's nothing that you're ever going to do that God says, I'm not, I don't love you anymore. Now, look at what it said. The, the second thing I want you to notice about this exchange is that it shows us that we must never forget the fact that each of us, all of us are sinners. The Bible says in Romans 3.10, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. In other words, no one's right. No one's, you know, the word righteous means does everything right all the time. You know what, never, never makes mistakes, never sins. There's not one. All of us are sinners saved by grace. You know, sometimes we, we look at the sins of the world around us and it's easy to think of ourselves as superior. Well, Pastor Vic, I, I'm not perfect, but I'm not that way. I, I don't do this. You know what, I'm not a Hitler, I'm not a Saddam Hussein, I'm not a Osama bin Laden. You know what, those guys were rotten to the core, they deserved everything they got, but you know what, I'm not that bad. And yes, I agree, they did deserve what they got, but you know what, it's by the grace of God that you and I don't get what we deserve, because all of us fall short of the glory of God. Can I hear a good amen to that? We're all sinners. Never forget that. The third thing I want you to learn from this story is that, you know The world may accuse us, but Jesus will always be on our corner. He's always in our corner. Now, that doesn't mean that Jesus excuses our sin. It doesn't mean that, you know what, our sins and our faults and our shortcomings are unimportant. No, no, it's very important. It was so important that God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross. If it wasn't important, Jesus would not have had to have died. 
The fact that he died means that this is important to God. But God cares about you. He cares about me. He's not an accuser. You know, accusations, you know, is the work of the devil, our enemy. The Bible says the enemy, the devil is a, the accuser of the brothers. And the Bible teaches, and I don't want you to forget that, as a Christian, we should never participate in, in you know, accusing or, or judging or pointing out the wrongs of people. And listen, we need to be careful we're not doing that. And don't be fooled when it's directed toward you. The truth of the matter is that we all deserve punishment. We all fall short. But Jesus Christ is not the accuser. He's the Savior. The Bible says there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. He came to save. He didn't come to put you down. He came to lift you up. And, and sometimes, you know, we, we, we have a hard time with that. Because our brothers and our sisters, part of the family of God, some of them don't have it together. And, you know, some of us want to beat up on them. Like the Pharisees, don't beat up on them. Love them. See them as precious in the precious of God. This is how I do it. You know, I have a daughter. I have daughters and I have a son. I, I will treat your daughters and your sons the way I want my daughters and my son to be treated. You know, if I don't want my daughters mistreated or put down or criticized, you know what, I'm not going to do it because I don't want you doing that to my kids. You know, and, and Jesus is in our corner. We always remember that. Now, the woman caught in adultery, notice what happens to her. The first thing the Bible tells us is that she's offered a pardon. She is pardoned. Look at what it says in verse 10. And then Jesus stood up again and said to the woman, where are your accusers? Didn't even one of them condemn you? No, Lord, she said. And Jesus said, neither do I. Go and sin no more. You know, if anyone could have condemned her, it would have been Jesus. But he doesn't. And the Bible tells us that rather than condemnation and punishment, he pardons her. He forgives her. Because that's why Jesus came. John chapter 3, verse 17 says, God sent his son into the world not to judge the world, but to save the world through him. That's what he came to do. He came to save the world. He came as a savior. One day he will come a second time and he will come as a judge. But right now he's a savior of the world and he reaches out his arms to you and he says, come as you are. I love you. I care about you. You know what happened to that woman that day? That day she received the grace of God. You know what grace is? Grace is a pardon that you and I don't deserve. She didn't deserve it. That's what the grace of God is. It is a pardon and his forgiveness for something you don't deserve. You didn't earn it. You could never pay it back. And then he extended her mercy. You know what mercy is? Mercy is punishment she did deserve, but she didn't get. It was withheld. Thank God for his grace and for his mercy. You know, let me illustrate this because our God is a forgiving God. Our God doesn't hold our sin over our head. You know what? And every once in a while dips us into hell and out of hell and says, you know, until you get it right. He doesn't, water, he doesn't waterboard us with hell. Amen. Right? I was reading a story about a, how, how, uh, how, how, how forgiveness, you know, frees you and how uh, sin enslaves you. It was a little boy. And uh, he was visiting his grandparents and they lived out in the country. Out, you know what? Out in the, in the country they lived in, there were some woods and... You know what, he brought his slingshot. I don't know about you, but I grew up with slingshots. We would use slingshots when we were kids. And uh, he said, I'm going to take my slingshot, and I'm going to go out into the woods, and I'm going to practice. So he goes out into the woods, gets some rocks. It was terrible. Couldn't hit, a, couldn't hit any target. But he comes back to Grandma's yard, and he spied, he notices her duck. Grandma had a duck. It was her pet. And on an impulse, he gets a piece of rock, puts it in his, you know, leather pouch of the slingshot, you know, lets the stone fly, it hits the duck, and it kills the duck to his amazement. Duck <laughs> fell dead. Amen. The boy panicked. And desperately, he went and got the duck, he hid it under a wood pile that was there, and only to look up, and he sees his sister watching him through the window. Hmm. Her name was Sally. Amen. Sally had seen it all, but she said nothing. But after lunch... That day, Grandma said, Sally, I need you to help me wash the dishes. And Sally said, but, but Grandma, Johnny told me he wanted to help you in the kitchen today. <laughs> Didn't you, Johnny? And she whispers and says, remember the duck? So Johnny says, I'll, I'll, I'll do the dishes. Later on, Grandma asked if the children wanted to go fishing. Grandpa said, let's go fishing. Grandma said, you know, I'm sorry, but I need Sally to stay and help me to make dinner. Sally smiled and said, that's all taken care of, Grandma. Johnny wants to help you make dinner today. And again, she whispers at Johnny and says, remember the duck? So Johnny says, while well, Sally's out fishing, he's helping Grandma. And after several days of Johnny doing both his chores and Sally's chores, finally he couldn't stand it. He goes to Grandma and says, Grandma, I got to confess to you, I killed your duck. And Grandma says, I know, Johnny. Gave him a hug. 
I was standing at another window, and I saw the whole thing. But because I love you, I forgave you. I mean, you're more important than my duck. But I wondered how long you were going to let Sally make a slave of you and to hold it over your head. Amen? So listen, no matter what your sin may be, Jesus has paid the price for it. He, he didn't go to the cross so that he could hold your sin over your head, dump you in hell every once in a while. No, he did. He went to the cross to forgive you and release you of your sin from the bondage of sin. Now, this brings us to the last part of the story. Notice that not only did he give her a pardon and forgave her, the Bible says he gave her a purpose. Look at what it says in verse 11. Where are your accusers? She said, Lord, they're not here. And Jesus said, well, neither do I accuse you. Go and sin no more. Isn't it amazing? Isn't it a beautiful picture? Jesus offers this adulterous woman caught in the act of adultery a pardon for sure. But he doesn't just leave it at that. He gives her a new life purpose. You know, I, I don't think Jesus is saying, now woman, you better straighten up and you better fly right and I'm going to help you this time, but I'm not going to help you next time. No, that's not what he's saying. He empowers her to live above the level of her own sinfulness. He offers her a new life, an abundant life. Go. You don't have to live this way. You know, one of the beautiful things about coming to the Lord Jesus Christ, it doesn't matter what you were before. When you come to Christ, you realize, I don't have to live that way. I don't have to accept that's my destiny. I don't have to accept I'm going to be a, you know what, a, a whatever it is that you were, that you were in bondage to. And, and, and you, you're forgiven, you're set free, and now you're able to live a life that you've always wanted, that God wanted, that you never thought was possible. And that's what he tells that, that young woman. You see, the forgiveness of Jesus doesn't just free us from the burden of sin. It frees us from the burden of future sin. It empowers us to live above it. You know, Jesus did not expect this woman to go out and live a sin-free life on her own power. Jesus empowered her with his words, go now and live, leave your life of sin. Sin no more. Now, it was her decision. It was a choice that she had to make. And by the way, so it is with us. There are a lot of people that have come to Christ who have experienced the forgiveness of Jesus but have chosen not to follow and not to live for him. They're still living their old life. They're still living for themselves. And sometimes we scratch our head and we say, well, what happened? You know, I know people get saved. They get a brand new life. They're new creatures. You know, and I know others that they're the same. Well, what happened is they made a choice. And you have a choice to live for Christ with the power of Christ, or you have the, uh, the, the choice to just continue the way you are. There's a lot of people that continue, and that's very discouraging. And not only is it very discouraging, it's a, it gives the church a black eye, bad reputation. It's a decision. It's a choice. You know, and it's a choice that you have to make. I gave my life to Christ, and I said, Lord, from this day on, I want my life to honor you. And Lord, I need your help. I'm not, I can't do it on my own strength. But one of the things that Jesus does when you receive his forgiveness and his pardon is that he gives you a purpose, a life purpose. He transforms you from the inside out and he speaks into your life with authority and with purpose. Go now, leave your life of sin. That's why I often tell you life is better with Jesus. And, and, and not only is life better with Jesus, we get better at life. You know what? As we serve the Lord, as we walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. So here's this woman caught in the act of adultery and they're telling her, you're done, you're finished. The law says you are going to die. And that's probably what should have happened. Death by stoning. Jesus, let us take her out of the city and stone her to death because you couldn't do it inside the city. That's the result of her sin. But Jesus had a different plan. And by the way, there might be people that would like to see you destroyed, you know what, and wiped out, but God has a different plan for you. God's not finished with you. God wants to forgive you. He wants to set you on a, a new path. He wants to give you a fresh start. You want to make you a, a new creature, which means, you know, the creative process of God's Holy Spirit working in our life. He begins to transform us. That's what he wants. That is what the woman experienced. In her mind and in the minds of other people, you're done, you're finished. But in the heart of Jesus, you're not finished. If you let me, I'm just starting a wonderful work in your life. There are some of you here today, God wants to do a wonderful work in your life, but you got to let him. you got to come clean and say, Lord, I need you. Now let me take you to John chapter 19, because in John, the gospel of John chapter 19 captures the last moments when the sins of the world were upon Jesus and he paid the price. Jesus is on the cross. John tells us that he's been on the cross for six hours. By this time, uh, he's dehydrated. He's, he's in a lot of pain, not only physically, but mentally. It's, you know, everything. You can imagine Jesus on the cross. Look at what it says in verse 29 
of John 19. A jar of sour wine was sitting there, so they soaked the sponge in it, put it on a hyssop branch, and held it up to his lips. Verse 30. And when Jesus had tasted it, he said, it is finished. And then he bowed his head, and he gave up his spirit. It's finished. You know, in English, it's three words. It is finished. In the Greek, it's only one word. It's the word teleo or tetelestai. Uh, and it means paid in full. It was an accounting term, and it meant price has been paid. But, but what it really meant, that's what it meant, but this is what I want you to understand. It has been and will forever remain paid, and there's nothing that could ever happen to unfinish what Jesus just finished. It is finished. Nothing will unfinish what Jesus Christ did on the cross. You know, when I hear the term finished, I, I, I think of people who have messed up and are being told, you're done. It's over for you. There are some of you that, you know what, were caught, got in trouble with the law, arrested, thrown in jail, and people gave up on you. Family gave up on you. You know what, spouse gave up on you. Children gave up on you. Told you, society says, you're done. You're no good anymore. You're worthless. You know, and if you're not careful, you're going to believe I'm done. But on the cross, Jesus said, it's finished. Not you're finished. It is finished. What is finished? What's necessary for you to experience a new life in the Lord Jesus Christ? On the cross, Jesus took in our pain, everything. You know, uh, in the Garden of Gethsemane earlier, uh, that, that day, the day before, uh, Jesus was praying. And he tells the Father, Father, you know what, this cup, if it's necessary, let it pass me. In other words, if there's another way, uh, you can save humanity. If there's another way, people can know you. If there's another way of reestablishing that relationship that's been broken, you know what, I, I'm game and I'm okay with it. And, and the reason why Jesus prays that way is because he's human. And he knows the, how gross the cup was going to taste. He knew the ingredients. He knew what was going to happen. He knew what was going to happen the next day. Beaten to a pulp, crucified, mistreated, spit on, mocked, everything that you can ever imagine. And Jesus said, let this cup pass. Later on, the Apostle Paul tells us that Jesus was uh, uh, on the cross, that Jesus, as he consumed the cup that he talked about, he was to take the sins of the world. Look at what it says in 2 Corinthians 5, 21. It says, for our sake, he, Jesus, made God, made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. The Bible says that what was in the cup was the sin of the world. All the sins. Now, sometimes when we think that, we think, well, just the little white sins, the little white lies. No, no. The most vile of sins. Whatever, you know, all sins. Not some of the sins. You know what? The Bible doesn't divide the, the venial and the mortal sins or the, the easy ones in the battle. Sin is sin. And on the cross, on the, Jesus took this cup, and in this cup was the sins of the world. Jesus sacrificed his life on the cross as a sin offering for all people. That's what the Bible says. Later on, Paul writing to the Galatians in chapter 3, verse 13, he says this, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. In other words, not only did Jesus, the cup that Jesus drank, not only was it the sins of the world, not only was it the punishment and the wrath that you and I deserved, he took it upon himself, but the Bible says he became a curse. His cup was filled with the curse from God that should have been our curse. You know, when someone curses you, is that they just give up on you. They're just like, you're no good. You don't matter anymore. However, Jesus made what has been called the, the great exchange. He became the curse on the tree for all humanity for all time in exchange for us so that we would have the opportunity to know God and experience God. Do you know why you and I can have a relationship with God? It's because of what Christ did on the cross. I, I'm always fascinated by people who say, well, Vic, I don't believe that. I, you know, I, I'm going to do my best and I believe God is just and I think when I get to heaven, I'm going to negotiate. I'm going to say, Lord, I did a lot good. Yes, I did bad, but hopefully my good is better. And uh, he's going to let me into heaven because they do believe in heaven. And I'm going, to, I'm going to tell you right now, that's not going to work. Amen. You're never good enough. If you and I could be good enough, then Jesus would not have had to have come. In other words, that whole Easter thing is a, is a, is a farce. It's, it's ridiculous. Why, why did he have to come if we could save ourselves? No, you cannot save yourself. But in our pride, we want to think, I got this. No, you don't have this. And unfortunately, sometimes it takes us to hit rock bottom to realize, I don't have this. Listen, Jesus on the cross, he took our sin, he took our punishment, he took the wrath of God. He took the curse that was ours. He drank a cup of wrath filled with the sins of the world and everything about us. And he drank all of it. In other words, to the bottom. It was bitter, six hours long. 
He consumed all the content of the cup. From 9 to 3 p.m. there on Calvary's cross. And he did it for you and for me. Do you know that the words that is finished is only found in the Gospel of John? Not in the other Gospels. You know, and uh, you have to read all four Gospels to get all the seven sayings because they're not all listed in one. You have to put them together. But when Jesus uttered these words, he was declaring the debt owed to the Father has been wiped away completely. Paid, debt paid. The debt humanity had to God has been paid. No, not, not that Jesus wiped away any debt that he owed. He, he didn't owe a debt. He paid our debt. You and I had a debt we could never pay. He had a, we have a debt we could never make good on. We were so bankrupt. There was nothing. We were spiritually bankrupt. And only God, by sending Jesus Christ on the cross, you know, taking all of it for us that we could be saved. I love what the Bible says. You know that uh, before you and I come to Christ, the Bible says we're in darkness. We're dead. We're dead in trespasses and in sin. Look at what Ephesians 2, chapter 2, verse 1, Paul writes, and he says these words. Once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins. Verse 4, but God in his rich, rich, but, but God is so rich in mercy and he loved us so much. Verse 5, that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when, we raised Christ, when he raised Christ from the dead. It's only by God's grace that you have been saved. When Jesus Christ said it's finished, what he's saying is the work is done. It's finished. Man, time, mankind can now come and have a relationship with the Lord. It's been accomplished. You can't do it by yourself. You cannot earn it or deserve it. So what was finished? Well, let me just, and you're following me in your notes. This is what was finished. Number one, finished and completed were the horrendous sufferings of Christ. Never again would he have to bear the sins of the world. He took care of, their, took care of it there once and for all. Number two, what was finished was Satan's stronghold on humanity. Uh, Hebrews 2.14 says that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil. That means that you no longer have to be under the power of sin. You know, because of what Christ did on the cross, sin does not dominate you anymore. When you come to Christ, you can say no to sin. Before coming to Christ, you know, sin is very tempting, very, very, it's good, it's a good thing. But when you come to the Lord, you know, you're tempted and now you say, I can't do that. That is not what children of God do. That is not what God wants me to do. I don't have to listen to Satan. I don't have to live that life. Because you know what happens once we come to Christ, that doesn't mean that we don't, no longer are tempted. We're tempted. But one of the things that now, I don't have to do that. I don't have to be a drug addict. I don't have to be an adulterer. I don't have to be a, you know what, all of those things that are contrary to what God says. I can live for God because what Jesus Christ did on the cross, you know what, what he finished makes it possible for me to live over and above beyond the sin. That doesn't mean that we're sinless, but it says that now we don't have to practice it all the time. The third thing that was finished is what was needed for our salvation. It's done. You know that on the cross, all your sins and my sins were transferred to Jesus as he hung there on the cross. And his righteousness and his holiness was transferred to us on our account. So when Jesus cries out, it's finished. It means you can now come as you are and you can receive salvation and forgiveness. God's love, you can receive forgiveness. You can receive a new life. Yeah, but Pastor Bick, I, I'm not good enough. Exactly, you're not. You will never be good enough. But you come just as you are. Can I hear a good amen to that? You know, every time we take communion, and we're going to take communion in a few minutes, we remember, we remember what Jesus Christ, we remember that it is finished. We remember that Jesus Christ came to earth on a rescue mission, and, and his mission to rescue the world, you know, what has been accomplished, and he wants to rescue you and me from sin, from death, from Satan, from hell. And what Jesus Christ did is, is done forever, once and for all. It's available to everyone who would come and say, Lord, forgive me of my sins. I repent. I like what Hebrews says. Hebrews 7, 27. Notice what it says. It says, unlike other high priests, he, speaking of Jesus, does not need to offer sacrifices every day. They did this for their own sins first and then for the sins of the people. But Jesus did this once for all when he offered himself as a sacrifice for the people's sins. Notice. Once for all. It has been and will never remain unfinished. There's nothing that can happen to unfinished what Jesus just finished, paid in full. It is finished. That is why. That is why we reject uh, the teaching of the Eucharist of our Catholic brothers and sisters. 
Now, our Catholic brothers are brothers and sisters. They love the Lord. But the people ask, why don't we do, we're going to take communion, why don't we do it the way they do it? Because, first of all, in Catholic, in Catholic theology, when they take uh, communion, they are, they are literally taking the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. In, in doctrine, it's called transubstantiation. And, and what happens when a Catholic goes to the Mass and he participates in the Eucharist, he is literally, not symbolically, not figuratively, he is literally participating in the death of Jesus Christ. He is literally partaking of the body and of the blood of Jesus. And at the moment that they take it, their sins are washed away. But you got to do it before, you know, you got to confess before. Now, we reject that, and I'll tell you why. For the simple reason, the Bible says Jesus Christ died once and for all. For this, it doesn't have to happen every week or every day. He died once and for all. What Jesus Christ did on the cross, one time was enough. And what we have to do is we receive it. So what do we do when we take communion? We remember what he did and we thank him for it. We agree. The Eucharist. Eucharist is the Greek word, of karisto, and it's a word that means thank you. We are thankful. There's gratitude in our heart for what Jesus Christ did on the cross. So for those of you that have placed your faith and your hope and your trust in Jesus Christ and have allowed Jesus to drink your cup of wrath and sin of curse, you know what, today when you ask Christ into your life, you are forgiven. And when we take communion and we pause and we remember that he's a great God who rescued us, gave us back our life, we remember. When we take the bread, we remember that the bread represents the broken, broken body of Jesus that was cursed, that was beaten on the cross for us. The Bible says that he was beaten to a pulp. But he was beaten to a pulp so we can get our lives back. In other words, he, he drank that cup. And the contents in the cup are a reminder to us. He took our sin. He took our wrath. He took our curse. And because of the blessed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ that was poured out, we are cleansed from our sins. We are cleansed from cursedness. We're cleansed. We're no longer cursed. People say, well, Pastor, the other day I, I had someone come to the church and says, Pastor, I need you to pray for me. And I say, why? Because somebody... Somebody put a spell on me. Someone cursed me. There's a curse on my life. And I say, are you a Christian? Person said, yes, I'm a Christian. You know what? No one could put a curse on your life if you're a Christian. So get that out of your mind. Jesus Christ took all the curses. He took everything wrong that we deserve. He took it. But if it makes you feel better, I'll pray for you. And I'll anoint you with oil. But you can't be cursed. Because Jesus Christ was cursed for us. Amen.